Today on episode 19 of The Lockdown, we speak to the terrible twins themselves. Well, one of them, the only current Australian world boxing champion. And the other other half, possibly the next champion, when hopefully all this coronavirus is over. Um, Andrew, the monster, and Jason, the smooth one, Maloney. Thanks for coming on, boys. Thanks, Pleasure, mate. Us. Thanks for having us. Fucking awesome to have you on. I was actually pretty excited when I spoke with uh, Andrew the other day. And I said, look, what are the boys doing? He goes, oh, I'll speak to Tony. If they come on, this should be right. Well, I guess there's yeah, nothing much good, to do mate. at the moment. Good to finally meet you anyway, mate. It's, uh, oh, yeah, well, her, her I met you boys. <laughs> I, I met you boys years ago in Banzer. Real, real, real sure. briefly, yeah. Real briefly, yeah. yeah. And uh, these, were, these were fucking, these were tiny. These were, well, he's not fucking huge now, but these were, <laughs> three, these were very young, I remember. Yeah. And uh, I'll yeah. go into that story yeah. later on today. But, uh, no. mate, what have you been up to, boys? Um, lockdown. It's You're in New South Wales. You're at Kingscliff, correct? Yeah, yeah that's, that's right, mate. Um, um what things, aren't really, things aren't really that different for us to be honest like we we tra- we're still training every every day so we train in the mornings um and then pretty much at home spending time with our young family so that's pretty much what we normally do the only um real difference is we can't fight we should have been over in america last weekend mm. he defending my world title and jason basically in a world title eliminator um, fighting in front of a sold out Mandalay Bay. So that's the only real difference, but it's a, it's a pretty massive hit and we're pretty spewing about it. Um, I, I bet both of you always stay in shape regardless. Um, I, I've spoken to Ange in detail about you a few times. Um, you got that mentality that, and that's what makes the world champion. You got, you have to be, yeah, you have a fight the next day. We tell you to take a week off. You're back in the fucking gym going for a run or, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's, that's I, I, and just told me that's how you guys are, and that's that's how champions have to be. Um, yeah. How much do you reckon by your timing? Um, obviously, because you're not getting enough sparring. Uh, have you been sparring each other or not? Well, that's a no. That's a no. To know, so we'll just. No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not allowed, mate. Not allowed. That's we don't break rules. <laughs> no, don't break rules. But yeah. it's it's I guess the 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 hardest thing would be losing your timing because you know sparring so important and integral in your in your training um yeah. have you got any like game plans ready to go because both of you will be pretty much jumping out the fucking um jumping off the, the starting line as soon as it's ready to go right yeah that's right that's what we're hoping anyway um it's good to see top ranker trying to put things together to make the fights happen as soon as possible uh the only concern for us is whether we'll be able to get actually get over to america to fight obviously there's all the travel bans and everything going on at the moment so um hopefully um you know things are changing daily so hopefully some um you know good news comes soon it will be essential travel given it is for work so hopefully um yeah we can get over there straight away and, and fight as soon as possible um we're like you said we keep ourselves in great shape and you know other guys might after this all folds over they might want 10 or 12 weeks of sparring to prepare and get themselves in fight shape but me and Andrew really, yeah, would be ready to go in, you know, a week or two. To be honest, we're um, yeah, in great shape. Really? Trained the whole way through. I'll be um, yeah, I'll be ready to go straight away. Yeah. How are you boys on weight? Like, how far off weight are you? I'm less. I'm less than five kilos over, so I could make weight in a week. Really? Yeah, and that's yeah, what you normally sit on. Here, Fuck, uh, that's great, boys. I won't say that's what I normally sit on because. I used to blow up in between fights and, and get quite heavy. But these days, we, I think we're getting a bit more mature now. And, um, yeah. you know, we, this, we realise this is the peak of our careers. And we're, the, a big help has been moving up here to Kingscliff. You know, we've got no distractions. We don't know anyone up here. We're not, you know, our teammates on the weekend and, you know, eating out, things like that. We're just focused. And since we moved up here and, you know, dedicate ourselves 100%, I'm um I'm walking around yeah just overweight and and ready to go all the time. Well, yeah. One of the big issues. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Go. Hey, you're right. Jace? You're right. Yeah. I was just gonna say. I think it's enough. You know, it, it's been professional, but it, it also comes with a bit of maturity. Like a lot of guys, when you first turn professional, you go, "Oh, how good this? I'll weigh in, and then I'm not fighting for you know another few months. I can just blow out and I can eat all this food. You know, you go nuts and you just." You put on ten or fifteen kilos on, but you got to You can't live like that, especially at the top of the sport. It it, it just yeah. it puts too much strain and too much stress on the body. You got to stay in shape, and me myself, mentally and physically, if I'm in good shape, I feel so much better. So, 
yeah, I mean, me and Andrew now, we stay you know, within reason. Angela gives us a limit that we can't go over, but yeah. um, we don't even, we don't even need that anymore, to be honest. We, we keep ourselves in good shape. And, yeah, mate, look, if they said you can fight tomorrow, no doubt I'd go for it. I mean, everyone's in the same boat, so it's not like anyone's got mm. a real huge advantage. But me and Andrew have worked extremely hard to this break, so... Um, I think there's a lot of blokes that wouldn't be. And, yeah, we'll have a leg up as soon as we can get the green light. Mate, um, one issue that, you know, look, this, everyone's still got the ideals that our uh, boxers just go for road runs, they hit the bag, they hit the pads. No, the game's changed. There's a lot of s and involved, a lot of sports science. Um, like, I'm, I'm lucky enough I bumped into a mate of mine, uh, Chook. I'll give him a shout-out. Uh, Max300.com today. Uh, mate, he's got all this mad equipment, right? It's like a nice bench, got nice... Um, it's all in one bench, all in one, um, uh, what is it called, like a, a, you know, a, the, the tower and the, the dumbbells are adjustable with weight. Um, I, lo- I was lucky enough to see him, I got all that. So I've been training my weights, right? But if I hadn't yeah, trained for six weeks, I would go backwards incredibly. You guys, oh, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd say, would it be exactly the same because yeah. your muscles already deplete so easily because of the repetition of boxing. How yeah. you guys kept up with your SNC stuff? Uh, not, 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 not. Not been able to access, or have you got access to a gym or a home gym? Yeah, yeah. Well, our gym is a private gym, so it's only me and Jason in there. We we built that for ourselves. Um, it's a year and a half, two years ago now, right and there. so we're lucky that we've we've been able to train and we've got all our boxing stuff there and all the strength conditioning stuff that we need. So nothing's really changed for us training wise. Well, that's that's good to hear. Actually, that's that's really good. So do you have an SNC trainer that comes in as well? Oh, outside? No, <laughs> we, on the field? No, no, we don't actually, mate. Um, it's probably some we do we do um some sort of strength conditioning circuits and we keep the main areas of the body strong. Uh, you know, like your neck, your forearms, your core. We do a lot of that sort of stuff. But uh, Angelo's got the opinion, and and we've got the same opinion now that um you don't really need to be doing a lot of this other stuff that you see some of the other fighters doing, you know like you know crazy heavy deadlifts and real heavy squats and things like that. We've dabbled around with that sort of stuff in the past and done like you know the real strength training stuff. And and to be honest, it may be different for other people, but we didn't feel like it really worked for us. You, you see, you're lifting heavier. And you think, oh, I'm getting stronger, but it doesn't. I didn't find it transferred over to my to my boxing and my strength inside the ring or my punching power or anything like that. So, to be honest, we we do like a whole heap of body weight circuits and things like that. They're yeah. real high intensity, um, but we don't do any crazy heavy lifting. It's a lot of body weight and explosive work. Well, I guess you got to stay small too. Like you guys are in, you know, super flyweight and bantamweight divisions. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, for the viewers, that's fifty one and a half and fifty two and a half. Is that right? Well, fifty point six. Is that? Yeah. Uh, super, super flyweight's fifty two point one six. Fifty two point yeah. one six. And bandweight's what fifty three point five. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to stay around that? It's very. You know, you put on a bit of muscle mass, and now you said it right. You think about the best small fellows in the game. Your Mexicans. Your your Japanese. Uh, you know, you're Filipinos, and you look at now. I'm thinking about you know watching them train. You basically never seen really doing that hard S and C stuff, like the heavy weights and everything else. Maybe it's no, something right. to do with yeah. You can't. I, I, your I divisions aren't made up by three kilos; they're made up by about a kilo, kilo and a half. That's yeah. right. And I, like yeah, saying I'm not saying that strength conditioning's not good, and it's not you know boxers don't need it. I think as you get heavier, the heavy weights, cruiser weights, things like that, definitely there's a you know a big advantage yeah. but for us um we still do strength and conditioning but yeah it's not it's not your typical uh session that you probably see a lot of other boxers do but it's what works for us and we i feel strong strong as ever and yeah we don't we don't lay on a bench and lift any heavy weights or anything like that but we we work a lot on our explosive power and yeah i think we both got a decent punch for a little fella so Half a decent punch. I'll give you. I'll give you that. Half a decent <laughs> fucking some power. Good to watch. I enjoy. I, I've always loved enjoy. Like, I've always enjoyed watching it. Um, very aggressive. Which, um, in that division, you got to be obviously. Um, yeah. and we'll go into some advice that's been given to you guys, and obviously you've taken that in, and it's really yeah. working for you. 
Um, both of you from originally from Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's the difference between Melbourne and Kingscliff? Bar the massive city and the shit weather. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Victorian boys. I, I'm from yeah. Victoria, so it's fucking hot, but yeah. <laughs> but I'll be, yeah. it is fucking cold in Melbourne. Yeah. No. The the our, the main difference is probably for us is. It's just a lot more relaxed and a lot more focused for us just on boxing. There's there's no distractions. Um, our gym's five minutes, not even, from our house. Our massage therapist is two minutes from the house. Our chiro's, oh, physio's about three minutes. Like, everything's short. So, like, we'll train and do those, those extras that we need to do and I'll go home and rest in between sessions. Whereas when we're in Melbourne... I was training, I was personal training in the morning from like 5.30 till 10 o'clock. Then I'd drive all the way into Richmond, which would take me about an hour, hour and a half, <clears throat> do my strength conditioning, drive back out and pretty much go straight to my boxing training. And by the end of the day, I was completely exhausted. I spent half the day in the car and stuck in traffic. Yeah. And, you know, you're eating on the go and you're not getting time to rest. And all those little one percenters really make a difference. So. You know, these days we, we train, we rest, we do, you know, our recovery sessions, our physio and things like that and rest and get ready to train again in the afternoon. And we're just spending so much more time on recovery and just doing things correctly and having no distractions. It makes a massive difference, I believe. Well, both of you have a young family. Um, Chase, you're, like, you're engaged with a little girl. Andrew, you're, yep, uh, right. you're married with a little boy, yeah? Yeah, They're right. basically around the same age. How much difference is there between them, between the little ones? There's four, four months, months between the little ones. Yeah. Who, who win the scrap? <laughs> oh, cousins always fight. <laughs> my, yeah. my daughter bashes my uh, my my my, uh, my brother-in-law's um, son. Yeah. You know, he's, he's a lot larger. He's a, does he all have a crack or what? We're she going to train his boy up. Oh, yeah. oh, she's a fucking boy. My kids are... <laughs> she's three-year-old. She yeah. at the age of three, she was she was doing our uh, jujitsu. At the yeah. age of eighteen months, she was hitting the pads correctly. Like she's just one of those tomboys. But I think she's yeah. Elsa from fucking from our uh, Frozen. So, yeah. but it's, it's look, it's giving you more time. Obviously, um, you both, uh, yeah, you, everything's so ideal. It's right next to yourselves, down the street, across the road. Yeah, um, a lot more time with your family. And as you get older, a lot of the problems boxers possess, and I've seen this firsthand from world champions and from you know, all the ones I've worked with in Mexico or in America, family's one of the main reasons why they start to turn off. So if you've found this great norm where your missus are cool with it, the kids just getting to see your kids a fair bit, um, you've got all that time. It's, it's a very smart move. Um, as, a, yeah. as kids, so how Sorry, do you – Yeah, No, it's fine. Yeah, say, um, say, Jason. Say, and, yeah, look, like the other thing apart from all that saving time, it's just, yeah, a beautiful lifestyle up here. Like, when we initially made the move that we were going to leave our former trainer and which was a really, really hard move for us. To, but we decided to come up here and do a bit of a trial with Angelo. We had absolutely no idea where Kingsley even was. We had no idea. And we just thought, no, let's just give it a go. So me and Andrew came up here and stayed in a crappy little hotel in Coolangatta and had a hire car and came out here and, and did a few weeks with, with H. But when we got here, we just couldn't believe it. Like, how good is Kingscliff? Like, we're, oh, both, we're both a rock throw to the beach. And, you know, instead of being freezing cold, doing our morning run with, you know, snot dripping out of your nose, freezing, <laughs> we're, we're running along the beach with the sunshine on our back. And you just feel fantastic. And like Andrew said as well, there's no distractions up here either. So the lifestyle uh, for an athlete is, yeah, it's ideal. But, um... You both grew up in Melbourne. What made you get into boxing? You, you know, you, you're obviously pretty talented, both of you. So, very, like, I wouldn't say mirror image, but not far off. You're very similar in your styles. What? Why did you get into boxing? We, um, <laughs> no talent here, I was going to say, first of all. We, um, we'll get into that. I lost my first seven fights, so there's no talent. But, yeah. um, but uh, we got into boxing. For some reason, Santa Claus thought it'd be a good idea to give a couple of competitive twins a set of boxing gloves each for Christmas one year, when we were probably oh, maybe 10 years old. So we used to throw them on in the living room and just go at it and just 
beat the piss out of each other for about an hour straight um, and just loved it. And um, then we were about 13, our, our, our dream was to play AFL football. So all the footy teams were doing a bit of boxing during pre-season for extra fitness. So we thought, we'll give it a go. We'll go down to the local gym and, you know, just take it up for a bit of extra fitness. Um, and then we just fell in love with the sport and um, decided to get rid of get rid of footy, stop playing footy and just focus on boxing. And, yeah, here we are 17 years later. I heard a little different story. I heard, <laughs> I heard that both of you are massive wrestling fans. One of you thinks they're Lex Luger, and the other one thinks he's Kevin Nash from NWO. Is that a, is that a reason why you might have become boxers? Because you love the fucking the WCW days, or what? Now, be honest. Yeah. Pick yeah, you up, we'll get pick... in that ring. You want to beat some people up. We're working on a bit of stand up to to eventually make it to the WWE, but it just never eventuated, mate. <laughs> Look, yeah. um, you said you lost your first seven fights. Yeah, that's that's, right. that's, that's great because I talk I talk to kids all the time. I Rob Medley, remember Rob Medley? Yeah, yeah, mate. He didn't have the greatest of amateur careers, right? Yeah, I think he was pretty even. I think 50 50 or similar to it. He wasn't great. I think he made. Com Games or Olympic, one of the, I think he made the Com Games one year, mate, but he started off really bad, I reckon, he just got better and better and eventually fought for a world title twice, um, yes. lost both times, but, mate, it doesn't really mean much, this is what people go understand, especially the amateurs, you lost your first seven fights, um, how did you end up in your career, in the amateurs, um, as in yeah. numbers wise? I had eight, about 80 fights, and yeah. I probably lost 25 maybe? But all my all my fights were basically international. From 17 years old, I made the Australian team, and there was no one around my weight in Australia. So pretty much all my fights were international. So I was at 17 years old fighting against men who have had like 300 fights. So you take a few losses along the way, but as you said, it doesn't matter in the amateurs. You know, your record doesn't doesn't matter. It's all about experience. Um, and for me, I I knew sort of fairly early on that I wanted to turn professional at some point. So for me, it was just about learning and and developing and doing my apprenticeship for the professional game. How about you, Jace? How many, how many fights do you have in the amateurs? Similar? Yeah, I had about 80 as well. Um, not as many international as Andrew did. Um, but I lost my first three fights, um, and then, then I managed to get a win on the board and, and showed him how it was done. But... Um, <laughs> yeah. It, it it wasn't so much that it, at the start like we were playing footy and we were boxing at the same time. We we're only probably boxing twice a week, but we had a couple of guys at the gym said you guys should you should start fighting. You got a, you got a fair bit of potential, and we were trying to do both, um, play footy and box. And you work out pretty quick as we did. You can't sort of half ass boxing. You got to be all in. So. Rather than giving up after losing seven fights in a row and me losing three, we decided, all right, let's stop footy and let's give this everything and see see if we can actually do something with this sport. And I think uh, you know, after Andrew lost seven, he went on a winning streak and didn't lose in Australia for another five years or something like that. But as soon as we dedicated ourselves to the sport, we were we got on a real roll. We within two years, I think we were both we both went to the 2010 Commonwealth Games in Delhi. Yeah. Um, and then four years later, Andrew went and won the gold in, in Glasgow Commonwealth Games. I those games, which I won't go into too much, but it was a bunch yeah. of bullshit. But we both went pro and then started chasing world titles. But but the moral of the story really is if if you want to give it one hundred percent, then you'll get results. If you're going to play around, you know, half ass it or not take it completely serious or try and just have a you know have it as a bit of a hobby it's it's not really a sport where you're going to be able to get any success it's boxing you've got to be all in 100 percent. and suddenly when you get punched in the face you realize that <laughs> yeah, I, um, I remember my, my first i lost my first fight and I, I remember getting punched in the head going what the fuck am i doing here and how come i didn't train i'm an idiot <laughs> but um both of you look you we're talking about the amateurs for now um you had very good amateur careers obviously Andrew did uh, two com games, three world titles, uh, world championships. Yeah, mate, you're you're an amateur 
Andrew, your, your, you know, your dream is not to be the WBC or WBA or IBF champion. As an amateur, your dream is to go to Olympics and be an Olympic medalist, right? Yeah. Um, both of you would have had the fire, and that's would have been 2012, um, would have been, you know, obviously what you thought ultimately would take both of you to the Olympics. Uh, yeah. Where was 2012? Uh, London. That's right, London. Um, yeah. You, know, uh, you lost to Jackson Woods, right? Yeah, I did, yeah. Right? And you lost to Ibi Bella, didn't you? Yeah. Wait, I where was this titles? Was that was that the one that was at Tasmania? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That was at Tasmania. I was there for that fucking fight. Yeah, now, yeah. now as soon as you looked pissed off, I go, Oh fuck, I remember that. Because yeah. um yeah, massive contra the robbery of all time. <laughs> yeah, it was Man, it was fucking massive. I, I actually was right there. I was, I, was, I, was, I was there on the Sunday morning, I think. I'm pretty sure it was Sunday morning, was it? It was a Sunday yeah, morning. Yeah, yeah. Me and Lincoln, yeah. Oh, man, I, I was there because we went and watched Luke, Luke Boyd fight. And he fought. So, Jace, you would have lost in the semis. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And then Luke Boyd well, fought Luke Bella in the, in the final. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then, oh, mate, Ibi Bella had about 180 fucking cousins there or something. It was, it was fucking <laughs> massive. Honestly, half the stadium was fucking balanced. It was, it was huge. But, yeah. um, all right, so you got that fire of, of the Olympics, right? Now, yep. you're on the roll. Now, I understand why you turned pro, Jace. Um, yeah. Both of you have a pro style anyway, right? It suits you. But, Andrew, you've just come off winning the gold medal at Glasgow. Mm -hmm. Why did you turn pro as well at 2014 instead of looking towards that Olympic dream again? Um... Well, probably firstly, I seen what happened to me in 2012 and there's no way I lost that fight. I was completely yeah. robbed. And I was, what, 20, how old were we then? 24, Jason? Mm, uh, no, yeah. way young. Would way have been young. No, we would have been 23. Oh, uh, we turned pro. We turned pro, sorry. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. 23, 24, yeah. yeah. So I was thinking, I'm not going to hang around another four years and cut my pro career short with the with the chance of getting ripped off again um and to be honest probably for three years before that i was just hanging out for that commonwealth games i really wanted to go pro um yeah. i've been watching pro boxing then one of the big ones what year did will thompson fought, win the ibo world title 2013 i think it was 2013 november or december yeah yeah i remember watching that and that really made me want to go pro. Yeah. Watching that fight, Will probably has noticed, never said this before. And I remember watching that, I was going, stuff the Olympics, that's what I want to do. I want to win world titles. So for yeah. a good year or two, even in the amateurs, I was just holding off for the Commonwealth Games to, to win gold and go out with a bang. But I knew straight away I wanted to turn professional after that. The, the other reason I will say as well, um, like at that stage, like Andrew said, we're 24. And you just don't have the backing in this country to hang around in the amateurs. Like you see oh, some of the other other countries and all the successful nations in, in boxing in the Olympics. These guys that are winning gold medals are like 30 years old. So they're men fighting boys, really. With us, like those countries have national huge, ba you know, huge backing. These amateurs are getting paid good money to, to stay as amateurs and win medals for their countries. Yeah. Well, for us, we're 24 years old. Some of our mates, most of our mates had already already had homes. They had bought their first homes. Some of them already had, you know, an investment property. And we had literally not a dollar to our name. We'd just been on the Australian team doing the circuit, seeing different mm. countries and that. It's great. You get a great experience. You're having fun. But you come back home. For me, I missed out on those Commonwealth Games in 2014. And... I was a full-time amateur, so I was very lucky, but I didn't have a dollar to my name. So yeah. I miss out, the, miss out on the Commonwealth Games, which, again, I felt like I was robbed. I felt like I deserved to go there. Um, and I will go back home, and I've got nothing. I've got, you know, don't have a dollar to my name. I'm living with my parents, and, I, you know, I don't have a job. What do I do? So it's like, at least in the professionals, you can, I guess, financially, if you're good enough, have the reward. Whereas in the amateurs, what you, yeah. you can't you can't bring up a family with a medal. You know what I mean? No, impossible. And like you said, um, you know those guys that are 
at the elite level in those little nations, like those you know, Mongolia and in your weight division, it'll be like Ukraine and Mongolia and Russia and whatever, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Mate, they're fucking celebrities. They're, they've had 300 fights yeah. and they're institutionalized from a young age and they're getting paid big bucks and yeah. Yeah. flying I around remember, the fucking I, world. I tell, you, I tell you, when I, um, yeah. you before the Commonwealth Games in 2014, we did a training camp over in Ireland for, oh, I think we were there for about two months or something. And um, we're all getting paid. I think on the Australian team, we're getting two hundred and eighty dollars a month. So, <laughs> you, you man, know, you're rolling in it. It doesn't. <laughs> you, you're struggling to survive. And we get over there to Northern Ireland, and they uh, to Ireland, and they the Northern Irish team. They're all driving around in brand new Audis and BMWs, and they're getting they're making bullshit. A really, hundred percent. They're getting paid a couple of grand a week just to stay amateur. So. That's why they're winning medals because wow. most of them don't go pro. They stay amateur. They, you know, they got the experience of 300 fights or so, and they're they're mature. They're 28, 30 years old. Whereas everyone in Australia, you get to 18 and you go, stuff this. I'm not living off 280, 280 bucks a month. I'm going pro and trying to make some money and and make some from the sport. So that's why we can't compete with these countries on a Olympic level. Well, just. You beat Mickey Collin, didn't you? In 2010. Yeah, well, that's what I was laughing at. Like, I, I, at 20 cent, I beat Michael Collin, and I knew that in 2014, if, uh, if I had gone to Glasgow, which he ended up winning the gold medal, I knew it would have been out yeah. of me and him. I, I just always knew that if, you know, I'm going to get to the Commonwealth Games and it's got to be out of me and, and me and Collin, and, you know, he's going to want that revenge, and, and I believe I can beat him. And I remember Andrew came back from Ireland, he goes, Oh, you should have seen I was over there. Collins over there who's driving this Audi and all that. These guys, they, like, they're loaded. They're, they're, they have, they've got the Irish lottery or something that backs them. And, yeah, oh, yeah. these guys, they're just living the life. They're, yeah, getting supported and they can, yeah, chase that Olympic gold. But pretty hard for us. Well, one, one thing is money. That's a huge thing. But another thing is you can't guarantee um, the result. Like you, if you win the fight, it's not you always. You don't always win. That's the bad thing about Australian amateurs. I think it's worldwide, really, as well. But yeah, you know, yeah. like you, both of you have been fucked over. I'm sure many times. Um, I've been there with my fighters being fucked over, and you know, they, and especially with the Australian program, they invest money into certain fighters, and they want to see those boys get up because in the end of the day, oh, they would put money into them, or Victorian boxing, or New South Wales boxing put money into them. They need to get them up because there's yeah. an ulterior motive for it. Um, but you've made the transition to the pros, both of you in the 2014. Um, one yep. in one earlier. Who was first? Jay, two first day. Yeah, yeah. I was about well, yeah, a couple of months before Andrew. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So home, you both. I got, home, I got home from the Commonwealth Games, and Jason had his debut. I think a week after I got home. So okay, he had a, okay, he had cool. a bit of a head start on me, and then I didn't make my debut till I think November that year. So pretty late in the year. Well. Um, how do you find that transition from the amateurs to the pros? I know your style complemented the way you turned pro because that is yeah. your style. Um, yeah, me and I was talking about this earlier. Me and Greeny had a good chat about this earlier in the year. Um, I was in Perth. I was over there in Perth with him, and um, and we're both just talking about uh, you guys and and how you've changed in the last couple of years. And he goes, he goes, mate. The first piece of advice I gave him was, fuck, you got to learn how to fucking jab, boys. Yeah, you can be yeah, the but, toughest pricks in the world, yeah. in your division especially, because you're yeah. up against – people don't – in this country don't understand. That super flyweight, bantamweight, super bantamweight, featherweight, they're fucking monsters. They're, they're out for blood. Now, these Mexicans and Filipinos and Japs, man, they're fucking monsters. understands this. The best fights you watch in the States are always the little fellas. They're always yeah. those guys from 51 to 59, always the best divisions. Um, how great. did you find that transition? How did you find that transition from the amateurs with the softer, you know, obviously softer gloves, um, more rules, you know, look, you know, fucking bo uh, pros are, it's a bit of a game too. It's not just punching. You can fucking throw an elbow here and you can wrestle a bit and lean on and blah, blah. Whereas you can't even let, you know, like everything gets pulled up in the amateurs. How did you boys find that transition from the amateurs to the pros? It was a pretty smooth transition. Like we, like you said, we sort of always had pretty professional styles, and even towards the end of 
our amateur careers, they'd already started transitioning, turning the amateurs a little bit more pro style. Like they made the 10 9 scoring, no head guards, things like that. It started to become a little bit more pro. But we were always sparring a lot of professionals as well, even when we were in the amateurs and watching a lot of pro pro boxing as well. So we really just had a bit of a, you know, a, a pro style. But one of the things that I just loved when we turned professional is we were always extremely hard trainers and really fit, had massive engines. And in the in the amateurs, you'd be in a three round fight. The first, you know, round or two, it's back and forth, back and forth. You'd start into wear them down. You get to the end of the third round and you're at, your opponent's exhausted and we're just getting warmed up. So yeah. I, I used to hate that. The, the, you know, these undisciplined guys who don't train hard could just get away with, you know, sort of, just sort of, you know, winning it That's through, me. through three rounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you can sort of, you know, you, if you're taking <laughs> shortcuts and you're not disciplined, you're not training hard, you can almost get away with it over three rounds, but yes. not in the profession, not over, not, not over 12 rounds. So... I love it that we get, you know, get the extra distance and you can actually see who, you know, who trains hard and me and Andrew got big engines, so I like, I like going the longer rounds. Um, have you had any roadblocks? Like, I'm, it's not easy. Um, like you said, financially to drain. Uh, when you first start in the pros in this country, you haven't got much. I'm very lucky that you've got someone like Tony involved with you, Tony Tolsch. Um, very, very well advised in the business. He's been there, done that with Chris John and helped out at Harry's gym for years. He's got a lot a wealth of experience and knows a lot of people. But even with his assistance and even like prior to Angie, you had, you know, Brian there and we'll talk about this. Um, these guys are, you know, been there, done that. They know how it is. But financially, it's always a fucking burden. Was there any other burdens bar money? Oh, sorry, roadblocks bar money that you guys come across in the initial part of your, of your careers? Um, I mean, I'll probably go back to, I think we'd had about five fights at this stage, um, about five pro fights each, and we didn't have a promoter, didn't have a manager, felt like we were sort of, we couldn't really see the light at the end of the tunnel, like we couldn't see where, you know, where things were going to go, there was no sort of map planned out as to how we are going to get to where we wanted to be, and we bumped into Danny, Danny Green over in America, the night before the Mayweather Pacquiao fight. And that changed our career. We, we yeah. were talking to Danny, got along with him, organised to catch up with him when we got back to Australia. And when we got back to Australia, we, we caught up for, for a coffee and he introduced us to Tony and Angelo and they started managing our careers and really mapping out what we needed to do and what belts we needed to win and who we needed to fight to make our way and climb our way up the rankings and, and become world champion. And, Meeting Danny that day changed our career. Wait, um, well, you said it before, so after a fight, fight you guys feel a bit lost. It, and, mate, it happens. Um, lucky, like, someone like Will had me from day one all the way yeah. through to the end of his career until he went to America, and I, I kind of let I, – I didn't want him to do it, and he went, and I just said, all right, well, we'll, we'll part amicably, right? And we're still best mates to this day. Um, you guys had Brian in your corners for years, right? And Brian's a good bloke, very nice guy. A yeah. fucking – like, he's a great man, all right? Um, and when it first happened, when was it, 2016, 2017? When did you first move over to Ange? Um, yeah, 2017. 20, 17, yeah, I, I, it was big news, all right, because a lot of people that don't understand the business at the lower end get a bit, oh, well, they should be loyal and they should be. It's not about loyalty. Um, you guys, only you know how important the corner is, right? How much wealth of experience brings and what it does for you at that higher level, at that next level. Um, you can fight for Australian titles all day long, but when you fight for a world title, it's a different fucking story. Anything from your raps to what the rules of the corner, it's not like Australia. Um, the rules overseas and uh, Jay Silverdown overseas, you fought in Orlando for a world title. It yeah. is completely different than Australian standards. It's so yeah. fucking strict, so much fucking rules. Um, you you have to have been there, done that multiple times. Now, you guys have gone to Angela Hyder out of advice from Greeny, and I don't blame you for it. I, I, again, I love Brian. He's a fucking top bloke. But um, obviously, I'm asking this just so you can answer, it was for that experience factor. There was no issue with Brian. It was just more the experience side of things, right? Like, you guys needed to go to that next level, 
And it's like saying you got a reserve grade coach, there's no disrespect to Brian, and then you got Angela Hyda, who's the first grade coach, or you know, the AFL Premiership coach, and he's been to he's fuck, he's been in about what, 30, 40 world title fights? He's been in Tyson's fucking corner. There's not many people in Australia that are as more experienced and as good as, as fucking Ange. So what was that reason? Was that is that the reasoning behind your switch? Yeah, basically, mate. Like like you said, Brian's a great bloke. We we don't have a bad word to say about Brian, and, and we still talk to him today. Um, yeah. You know, we still get along well, which is great. Which we, you know, we're very 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 thankful that we still have that relationship. Um, when we first moved, like you said, we copped a, you know a lot of backlash and a lot of people saying we weren't loyal and all that sort of stuff. And we're extremely loyal people. Uh, we we yeah. were with Brian for how long? Six years, in or eight? Eight years. Yeah. Um, and he did a great job. He's a great coach, and we were undefeated. Um, everything was going good from from the outside, but no one knows um, how things are going on the inside. And I'm not going to say anything yeah. bad about Brian, but you only get one opportunity with this sport. You only get one opportunity, and if you don't feel like you're improving every day, then you've got to you've got to do something. Something's got to change, and. You can sit back and say, all right, well, this is as far as I'm going, or you can do something about it. And we felt like we could get better and we felt like a change was needed. And we decided that we'd go up and do a trial with Angelo. At that stage, it, it, it wasn't even, we're leaving Brian, we're going to Angelo. We just said we need a change regardless. And we were willing to do a trial with a bunch of different coaches and find one that we, we thought jailed. Um, mm -hmm. Angelo was the first person we tried, um, but he'd only just recently had his, you know, major accident. Excellent. But but as soon as we got up here and started working with him, you know, he's a real perfectionist and got a real good eye for the game and obviously huge, huge amount of experience. And straight away from after day one, we are going, yeah, this is us. Um, walked out of the gym, I'm already a better fighter. Went, you know, went home, rested, went back the next day, walked out of the gym, I'm a better fighter again. And, even now, three. How long we've been with H? Nearly three. Yeah, three, years? three years. Yeah. Even now, literally, I know it sounds cliche and like you talk, you know, you you're talking rubbish, but we improve every single day. Like every day, we'll work on something, and you can feel it getting better. Next day, we'll we, you know, keep progressing, keep progressing until something is, you know, cemented in and into our styles, and then we'll keep progressing, keep progressing. And I feel like we've made huge improvements. And as hard as that decision was. I still believe that we made the right move. Yeah. I mean, um, his, Angelo's experience would be evident to you, Jace, especially, because, Andrew, you demolished... I, I want to say demolished. It was a fucking <laughs> tough fight against um, Elton Dari, but you fucking... You, you put him to the fucking... You put him to the sword pretty quickly as soon as he started slowing down. But your fight for the IBF world title, that was a tough fight. Um, Very tough. To be honest, at the start, you... You come off pretty slow, right? Um, and <clears throat> then you started really clawing back and really... I, I remember thinking, fuck, he's, he can win this. And I thought, for a sec there, you are going to win it. I thought you were going to win the fight. He could have went any way. Yeah. And yeah. the split decision was probably right. He probably just pipped you. But it seemed like you started to believe in yourself as the rounds went on. And yeah, I did. in yeah. those tight situations, a person like Angelo would really shine. You'd see, like, in a tight situation... Some people will crumble. He would. How was he in your corner with three or four rounds ago going, hey, you're fucking coming back? Is It was all that time and effort and that trust worth it in those in that little time there? Absolutely. Like, like some some people don't understand. There's a, there's a difference between being a good trainer or a good coach and a good cornerman, and H is exceptional at both of them. Like, being your trainer or your teacher in the gym is fantastic. He's the best. But... On fight night, the the control he has in that corner, his ability to read the fight, see what's going on, and you know change and adapt to different things as the fight's going on, and see, you know, he he, he can see things around or to a head that you know this is things this is starting to happen or this is starting to work. Do this, do that. That sort of experience is absolutely priceless. And I mean, I I probably start a little bit slow in that fight as you touched on. I don't know if that was 
just the experience yes. thing. I, I think I was really – we had this game plan in mind and I was really trying to stick to the game plan, whereas I probably just needed to fight the fight as it was, as it was going. Um, and once I sort of realised that it was starting to slip away, I was probably just losing the first few rounds. Then we changed the game plan, went to plan B, and I felt like the second half of the fight, I was really getting on top of him. And if it had been the old school 15 rounders, I think I would have stopped him. I think but you had it. Unfor- you had unfortunately, it, yeah. yeah, he was gone. I'm, he, I could hear his breathing. He was, yeah, he was, I'd really broken him down, but I just started a bit too late. But, um, you know, that that's uh, that's all in the past now. And I've improved so much since then. And me and H talk about it all the time. If we had that fight again, or if I fought, fought Rodriguez now, I'd destroy him. Yeah. Um, what about in 2018, um, 20, last year, you, you fought Elton Dari for the WBA title um, yep. on the Gallon ball card, right? Um, this is what gets me. And I just said it then. I said, on the Gallon ball card. You <laughs> fought for a WBA world fucking title. And, hey, it was the best footy fight I've ever seen, right? That was a great fucking fight from two yeah, tremendous good. fighters. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. They were fucking awesome. And I've always been a big fan of um, Gallons, um, just because of his engine. Um, I knew Barry Hall could fight, but I thought that he wouldn't be. I thought he'd quit. And mate, what a fucking fight! But you've gone and demolished this bloke. And it was a good. It wasn't like you got a, a fucking retard. You fought a very good fighter in Elton Dari, all right, from Guyana. He was, but you made him look retarded. Come was it round four, round four. You knocked him out round seven, round six. Stopped him. Uh, round was, was that? Going, it was going into round eight, I think. I think we finished round seven. Yeah. And it was going into round eight. But you started yeah. really. I think you got rocked, didn't you? You got rocked once. Did you get rocked in that fight? I did. Oh, yeah. Round, yeah, yeah. Me bad in round five, was it? Yeah, four or five. You got rocked, and you come back. It was a good. The come. He come to fight, uh, and and yeah. that's where preparation comes in. People like Angelo, and you call, will get you ready because they've been there fifty times, right? Yeah. Um, you've you've stopped this bloke, but then you've won the world title. Um, and fuck what me and Tony and Angelo and Greeny had to go through for that fucking title. Um, <laughs> mate, it was, it was the biggest mission of our lives, mate. I reckon I was, I was speaking to Greeny and um, Tony probably ten times a day for about a week and a half. But yeah. deservedly, you got, your, you got your chance at that world title. You were the number one contender. You did win your eliminator, and then. Everyone's talking about this cracker fight with Gal and Hall, which is good, great, but how does it feel not getting the recognition that you, you deserve? Like, this is, and this is not me, you know, trying to put you, like, put you down. This is, I, I'm, I feel for you. And I had Lucas on last week. Um, yeah. He goes, what about the fucking Malay twins? Like, they're killing it. One's a world fucking champion, and everyone cares about footy players. He's right. <laughs> and it's yeah. us boxing partners, you know, we're boxing people. What yeah. are how does it feel like no one just won a world title? You're the only champion in Australia, and you got about ten seconds. And they got about two fucking minutes. Yeah, well, like that's how Australian boxing has been for years. Um, and I understand that for me to fight for a world title in Australia, we needed someone to sell out the arena to, you know, sell the pay per view numbers, and that's what Gallon and Hall did. So. I was just thankful that I was able to fight for the title here in Australia because I never thought that was going to be possible. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it is disheartening that us boxers don't get the, the following or the attention we deserve here in Australia. But that's how it is. And, you know, I just hope that the people who watched that night saw us both fight and, and now start to follow our journey. And, and now I've got a world title and Jason's not far off. Hopefully... Australian yeah. public starts to pay attention and starts to get behind us. Well, uh, you, um, Jace, yeah, your brother gets up. You're going to be ecstatic, obviously, um, that your brother won a world title. Once all the kisses and hugs are over, be honest, did you just okay behind the door and go, fucking cunt, should have been me first? Yeah. yeah. Hey? <laughs> be honest. Did you fucking, I should have been should've first. Should've been. I should have been first. I let it slip. Nah, nah, mate. Uh, to be honest, nah, I didn't think like that at all. Like, yeah, we, we're, we're super competitive, but um, we, like, 
as when we first started boxing, we were that competitive. That all, all we really thought about was, I've got to get one up on him or I've got to keep getting better so I can bash him. But as you mature... And as you know, once you become a professional and you, this is this is your job, and we're in different weight divisions now. It's just about helping each other. And yeah. honestly, yeah, I was obviously stoked to see him win the world title, and hopefully, I can do it very soon. And hopefully, we can both hold on to the belts for a long time and help grow the sport in Australia. Because, like you said, it is a real shame that we don't get any recognition in any media or anything like that. But Hopefully, um, yeah, we can sort of be the face of Australian boxing, get the younger generation um, keen to get involved and help the sport grow. Well, like you said, um, you've got to hold the belt for a while. Um, we've got to make sure that you, you retain it. You've got good heads on your shoulders, so I know that you guys will bust your asses trying to keep it. But like I said, it's always going to be a battle for you guys because that division, both divisions are red hot. And yeah. you know, as you get older, you'll mature and you'll get bigger. And there's, mate, in the soup, Bannerweights, they're just as red hot and so are the Featherweights. Um, but you had, Jason, your next fight got cancelled. It's supposed to be on the Anzac Day, right? That's right. Um, you fight for the WO Eliminator. Yeah, um, it, was, it was sort of an unofficial Eliminator, I think. He's ranked number one, I'm ranked number two. But, um, yeah, I mean, the winner of that fight, you would have... Cosimero. Has earned, has earned this, has, has earned their um, shot at the world title next year. I, I did a bit of research in Costa America because I didn't know him well. I watched his fights. He, he's, he looks like half a banger, um, as yeah. all Filipinos are. He yeah. looks like a fight that you'd probably, to be honest, confidently speaking, not talking too far ahead, would probably would probably get up and get up pretty uh, convincingly. Um, how is that um, the career? What's his name? Anthony Greer? Joshua, Joshua Greer. Joshua Greer. How, how is he? I, I haven't... I, I, I tried looking for him. I couldn't find much on him. Uh, yeah, he's he's good, mate. He, he's he's twenty two and one. He had a loss early in his career. I think it was his fourth or fifth fight, and the guy he lost to, I think, it was only a four rounder. But that guy now, Stephen Fulton's a world champion at featherweight. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, he's a good fighter. He is, you know, a pretty brash black American guy who talks a lot, a lot, of, a lot of dribble oh, and um. Yeah. <laughs> brings brings a pillow to the ring and uh, you know has this night night thing where he where he thinks he can knock everyone out. But um, <laughs> oh, I, I don't mind him <laughs> for a long time. And yeah. um, like I watch everyone in my division, and at that stage, all the world champions were pretty well tied up because we had a newie fight in Casemiro in a unification yeah. fight, and then the WBC title WBC title was um tied up because they'd made Ubali, the Frenchman, the champion. Uh, his mandatory was Don Air, so they were going to fight. So we were looking around, who can we fight? We wanted the best possible opponent we could get, and Joshua agrees with top rank and on with top rank. So it was a really, really easy fight to make. I said, And I said to Tony, I want to fight him and see if we can make it happen. And, um, yeah, Tony did his, did his magic, and we got the fight. Anzac Day, Mandalay Bay, Las Vegas. It's going to oh. be a sold out crowd in front of millions of people watching on TV. I'm saying millions yeah. because Anui's audience in Japan alone is gigantic. So, Huge, yeah. what more could you want? That's an opportunity of a lifetime. And what I've been dreaming of, you know, an opportunity like that. And I'll get past Joshua Greer, make a real big statement in America by beating one of their guys and, you know, the, the world number one. And earn, earn another shot at the world title. And 2020 is going to be my year. I'm, I'm stoked. I'm going to achieve my dreams. And um, then the coronavirus comes along and stuffs everything for everyone. Who would have fucking believed that? Who would have believed that? Seriously. Oh, yeah. shit. Unbelievable. <laughs> what a joke. Two months ago, yeah. someone told me we're going to shut down Australia. I said, get fucked. We're not doing shit. As if we shut down the country. We shut down, all right. I'm here on the fucking podcast because I'm that bored. Yeah. I'm doing that. <laughs> but yeah. uh, Andrew, you um, you were fighting on uh, you were supposed to fight April 18, the week before. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, April 18 here, April 17 over there. So the week before, Jason, I was going to headline a show over in Oklahoma. Um, first defense of my world title, headlining a big card over in America. Again, it's been card. About. Yeah, ESPN card. Oh, um, so what you dream about growing up and on top of that, you know, we've been boxing for 16, 17 years and 
being an amateur full time, professional, working our way up, made nothing from the sport, and finally get in a position where you you start to think, great, you know, I'm defending a world title and making a decent pay, and starting to turn life around, and and things are starting to pay off, and then yeah, this came along, and now we don't know how long it's going to be before we can fight again, and we're doing a bit of labour to try and get by and feed the family. So it's just, it's just, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's the six and pretty hard to take, but we're just going to stay positive and keep working for when boxing does come back, we're ready to go and take off where we, where we were. Well, Andrew, in your case, the one positive in this, I see it as a positive, um, Roman Gonzalez knocks out Carla Diafai, right, and wins the world title. Um, now, for people that don't know Roman Gonzalez, he's one of the greatest small guys of all time. Um, yeah. Chocolatito, he's a, he's an animal of a fighter. He's a great fuck. He's great to watch. He's on the way down. He's very obvious he's on the way down. I'm very surprised he got up in that last fight. The way he did too, he dominated from start to finish. Um, now, with this fight being obviously postponed due to coronavirus, is there a chance that instead of you fighting, who are you supposed to fight? You're supposed to Israel Gonzalez, another Gonzalez. Israel Gonzalez. Uh, yeah. Nothing to do, not not related, are they? <laughs> nah. Not so it's no funny. Screen? No. <laughs> nah, they're, all, they're all Gonzalez. I fought Miguel Gonzalez, then Alton to Harry. Now Israel Gonzalez, and then probably Roman Gonzalez. I've had. But would you? <laughs> is there a chance that you would fight Roman first? Is there a chance? I hope so. So the the resolution with the WBA was they let. Roman Gonzalez fight your fire for the super title. Yeah. And I got elevated to regular champion and I would fight the winner. Yeah. But we didn't want to be sitting on the shelf for too long. So we asked if we could have a fight in between, defend my world title and then fight the winner within 120 days or so. Yeah. But now this has all come along. I, I don't know where it stands. We're just going to have to see what, what Tony and Top Rank want to do and what the WBA says. But, I'd love to fight Chocolatito, and if we can make that next, then I'm all I'm up for it. I'm well, keen. That's what I want. That puts you directly on the world map. You get over him, um, yeah. and again, you're on the way up. He's on the way down. It's perfect timing. Yeah, boxing is all about timing. Um, yeah. and it makes you a world like categorized fighter. Everyone knows who he is because he's yeah. fucking awesome. He's great to watch. Yeah. Uh, has a mate. He got fucking bang. He got bang like a motherfucker. Yeah. Um, and to get over someone like that, and you have that style that could break him down because yeah. he has been broken down in the past. Yeah. Um, let's hope match room boxing and because they'll probably have some type of options on him. Um, let's hope him yeah. and uh, you know, Eddie Hearn and Bob Aaron can do something. I know they don't get along too well, but yeah. Barry's Barry's a pretty cool bloke. And look, uh, Bob's a fucking great bloke, he's a cracker bloke. Um, yeah. let's hope, let's hope that's your next fight, mate, because I'd love to. We talk about elevation in your in your career. And yeah. obviously, by you getting elevated, your brother will go with you because, again, you, you two are – there's not many twins in world boxing. The Charlos, I think, are the only champions yeah. that have ever been two world champions champions simultaneously. Um, yeah. Hopefully, you get that fucking chance. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I – yeah, mate, it's, when I heard Chocolatino got up, I, I, you know, we, we watched the fight. I watched it after. I watched the replay of it on Fox. And, yeah. mate, he, he dominated the FI. Like, it, was, it was a – it was real weird because you thought, oh, he fucked, but as he's, you know, he's, he's, he's down and out, he's finished now his career, and he dominated that blow. And I, I think, how could they have not let you fight him? Is there a reason for that? Or obviously he's matchroom boxing. Um, how come that was such a big fucking drama? Did you have the chance to fight your fight? No, no, no. We never had the chance. We chased that fight for like three years. And he fought, um, he won the title off Lewis Conception. Yeah, so yeah. I fought Lewis Conception and we basically thought that I'll get through him and I'll get your fire next. Um, so I knocked Conception out and then they say, no, nah, we've got an eliminator for you. So I flew over to Chile and knocked out the world number two in his own backyard. Yeah. Thinking that I'll get your fire. Again, didn't get your fire. Um, they were talking about him fighting Estrada for a unification. Uh, so I thought, okay, well, Fair enough. The winner of that will become super champion anyway, so I'll fight for the regular title. Um, then that fell through, and then Chocolatito came out of nowhere, and they let him fight your fire, even though I was my mandatory was due. Yeah. Um, so the WBA let that go because of Roman Gonzalez's 
previous history of being like a four weight world champion and a legend of the sport. So I, I understand that. So they let him fight with Fi and they elevated me up the regular title. So I was happy with that. Um, and now I just hope that I get to fight Chocolatito next. And Fuck, I hope so. That's, that's what I want because that's like my dead former Manny Pacquiao moment. You know, I, I beat Chocolatito and I become a superstar overnight and that's what I want. At, at the worst, you, you become on the world boxing scene, everyone knows who you are and that's what we want. Yeah. Because it's yeah. you know you have to crawl before you walk and and you're still in this division where the what are those Inels in, how do you say pronounce it Inelie Inelie or now the yeah. Japanese guy Nui Nui he's the dominant force right now in that you know in the oh well, sorry in the bantamweight division I'm getting mixed up Bantam, yeah um, yeah sorry I was about to ask about the two brothers that's why uh, <laughs> but hopefully you get that you get that push on that. You can have a son like Chocolate Tito. The world starts talking about you, and then our regular press has to carry on, and get behind you, and that's what that's what we want. It's been a while since Victor Chinian or Greeny, yeah, you know, people were really taking on world ch- like proper world champions. Daniel Gill, that's the only way for you to start growing uh, your profile. And it's something we missed out with Will because we never had the chance to do it here. That you're lucky that you've got that chance now, and uh, yeah. make sure that if it does happen with Chocolate Tito, it's in Vegas. So I can come over for a fucking week and I'll get a right? I'll carry your fucking jock straps. I don't care. I'll do whatever. As long as I'm over there. I, I nearly came over for yours, Jace. I nearly yeah. came over for your fight. I was supposed to come over with Greeny. Up. I needed someone to carry me jock strap, mate. You need uh, mate, needed you. I'm, I'm there for security. If that Anthony Greer talks shit, I'll just fucking drop his team and whatever. All right? Those, those yeah. Americans don't like me. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're talking about the. Uh, and now we brought all, and fucking how do you say it? Yeah. And now we, they're fucking great, yeah, right? Yeah. I think yeah. your brothers fight that not no and not not Na, Na, Oya and Tacoma or Takuma. Yeah. They're yeah. brothers, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're brothers, yeah. Fuck, if he's thought about giving them a crack and say Japan versus how Australia. Good that be? How good would that be? Fuck, cool. I'll fight Na Oya and Andrew fights Takuma on the same night. We can yeah, do it. Cool. Yeah. We can do it as a tag team. Tag team boxing if we're the that's what they want. Tag team, sweet. Yeah. All for it, mate. All for it. Respectfully speaking, um, so Naomi is the champion, yeah? He's, he's the champion one. Yeah. Like, I just yeah. watched yeah. him the other day fight. Um, I watched a replay of him and uh, Donair, right? Yeah. And yeah. Great fight. Great fight. Great fight, but yeah, Donnie's on the way down. If fuck, he'd be a great fight for you to do as well, Jace. If you could, yeah, yeah. you had the chance, because um, yeah. he's on the way down and he's not as good as he used to be. But fuck that, and now he or Anui, whatever he is, fucking a fight. He's a um, Jace. Like these guys, you'll be looking at in the future. Um, how far off do you reckon you are, or you're ready to roll with these guys right now? Yeah, ready to roll. Um, like it, with my fight on on Anzac Day or April 25 in America. Um, that would have been 26 here anyway. But I was going to fight Joshua Greer. Uh, he was the WBO number one. I was the number two. Almost an unofficial eliminator. The main event of that show was a Nui versus Casemiro. And yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't you know, in the contract or anything. But basically, if I felt, if I was impressive enough and win that fight in really yeah. impressive fashion, a Nui or Casemiro, whoever won that one, you would, you would lean towards a Nui, but you never know. Um, the winner of my fight will fight the winner of their fight. So, so I felt like I could afford a Nui, um, you know, before the end of the year and had a chance at that stage. Well, he would have had three of the belts. So yeah. have a chance to become, you know, a three-time world champion just like that. Bang, you, you know, a unified champion. Dreams come true. Massive, massive fight. And as good as he is, I mean, I've, I've watched him over the years as a fan, watched him because I enjoy watching him fight. I think he's very good. A lot of guys put him in their pan for pound rate ratings. Like he's he's got a lot of yeah. hype about him. Um, but every time I watch him, I just I want to test myself. I, you know, I'm not here to pat a record or anything. I want to test yeah. myself against the best. And if he's the best man away in the world, then I want a shot at him. And I believe on my night that I can beat him. Other people might not, but um, that's why I get up and work hard every day because beating someone like that is uh, that's my goal. He's definitely beatable. Um, Donair, you know, four years, five years earlier, Donair, 
probably would have got over him, to be honest. The first three or four rounds is right up there with him. Um, it's yeah. just, you know, the younger, hungrier fighter started to really get on top of him, and that's the only difference. Um, but he yeah. does, like you said, he's got, he's got chinks in his armour. He can be yeah, beaten. Yeah, definitely. And I think and I think Don Air showed that, and a lot of people thought he was just going to blow Don Air away, but Don Air's still very good, even though yeah, like you said, probably past his best. But um, he, yeah, he definitely showed that. Um, you know, I knew he's like you said, got some chink in his armor. He's, he's vulnerable. He can get hurt, and um, yeah, he's not. He's definitely not um unbeatable. And every time I watch him with H, that fight excites us. I just. I just think that yeah, that um, that he's definitely there to be beaten, and um, I love to be the man that does it. We had a good time in Japan with H last time, and uh, Greeny was. I'd love to go back and pa- do part two for that fucking trip. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is there a chance of, mate, you and you and Brock Jarvis? Is there a chance of this happening? You think in the future he's getting pretty fucking big? Um, yeah, I think he's it's a great, great, right like, great matchup. I haven't heard. Um, he hasn't had a fight in fucking a good six, seven months, has he? Yeah, I think he, yeah, it's all about him fighting featherweight now, I think. He's a big yeah. boy. He's very, very tall. But, yeah, yeah these, yeah, these yeah, are the Aussie matchups you got to look at. Is these, are these yeah, things that you should right. probably yeah, have in the back never, of your head? Well, you never say never. Um, I think he's sort of moved up and gone to featherweight. You never say never. Look, um, but I would, I would have loved a, an awesome domestic dust-up, you know, I never got the opportunity to fight for an Australian title. I tried. I really wanted that belt. Mm. We tried even. I was at Super Band and waited at that stage, and there was no one there that would fight me for the belt. We even went up to featherweight and tried to fight the featherweight champion at that stage, and we just couldn't get the fight. So I just had to move on and accept that I couldn't win the Australian title and start chasing the, um, you know, trying to get world ranked rather than win the Australian title. But yeah. um. I'd love a domestic dust up and I'd love it if there's someone in my division that was, you know, world rated and, you know, a world champion or on the cast force, someone that we could create this, you know, big rivalry. Yeah. I just don't have it. Um, I think Brock's going to end up being too big and they're on their own path. So, you yeah. know, I wish him all the best and hopefully, yeah, he's good. At, hopefully he can win a world title and I can win a world title. And we can have a big fight down the line. I don't know. Never say never. Fuck for you, Andrew. The only domestic fight you might have is your brother. You got no one your fucking size, have you? He wouldn't want that. Mate. He wouldn't, he wouldn't Green, want that. Green brings it up every time we talk to him. He loves it. He wants to punch on. But, but I, I heard he's had the punch on. Yeah, we well, won. We who's, the, who's the champ? Who's the champ? the champ? I know who the champ is. Who's the champ? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna call up our our high school. And we can get him yeah, to get the the release, release the footage of our punch on in year nine you in, front of the whole, in front of the whole year level when I absolutely dusted him. You know what happened? <laughs> I'd, love to get, I'd, love to get the, I'd love to get the footage of this. Listen to how much of a dog this bloke is. <laughs> we're, we're fighting. And this happened, this happened nearly every, you know, every second day we're, we're getting a punch on. But everyone tried to do the right thing and separate us. One of my mates came up and he's sort of, Got my arms top behind my back and <laughs> dragging me away from Andrew. And Andrew just walked up and gone, Wah! Oh, that's shit, Andrew. Shit form. So that's shit form. Dog. What a dog. We, we really need the footage now because that's bullshit. <laughs> everyone's, Jace. everyone's pushing and shoving and he's trying to shove me into the locker. And I don't do the pushing and shoving. I just bang, right hand, right on the button. <laughs> He's got his white shirt on. There's blood everywhere. Oh, uh, just, did you get in trouble off your parents for the for the punch ups? No, oh, no, that, that we used to. Yeah, um, we used to punch on every morning when we'd be brushing our teeth, getting ready for school. We'd always punch on in the bathroom. So when our dad built our house, he made three bathrooms for one for me, one for Jason, and one for our older brother. So we wouldn't get we wouldn't punch on every morning. <laughs> <laughs> I say he's a free boys, huh? Is that how you grew up? Yeah. Free boys? Yeah. Yeah, I, I grew up free boys as well. So anyone that didn't grow up as free boys don't understand that brothers fucking punch on. And it's not <laughs> muck around, they're fucking proper punch ons. Um, I was the middle child. I was the middle child, so I I punched on with the little one and the big one. Yeah. Um so yeah, mate, it was it used to be fucking bedlam. Like my older brother's ten years older, he used to beat me up from the age of five. 
And then finally <laughs> got to about 16, I was about 110 kilos. I ended up belting him once and <laughs> give it to him. <laughs> and then the fucking tide turned. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, boys, look, hey, uh, we're at the end of the show. We're going to get after this uh, one-minute wonder, okay? I ask oh, you a yeah. bunch of questions, and you guys give me the answer to these questions, whatever comes to your mind, okay? Um, so who wants to, who wants to be the first and who wants the secondary? Andrew? Yeah, I'll go I'll go first, mate. Yeah. All right. Sure. All right, sweet. All right. So the best fighter you've fought against? Um sparring Lomachenko. Uh in a professional I will say Lewis Conception, just because he's a two time world champion. Even though I won the fight pretty convincingly. Uh amateurs Robizi Ramirez, Olympic gold medalist. What about you, Jase? Sparring and fighting. Yeah, sparring Loma, definitely. Uh, he's absolutely unbelievable. But I'd have to say my hardest fight was Emmanuel Rodriguez, I guess. I mean, I lost. So, uh, yeah, I'll have to say him. Who's the toughest fighter you fought against? Just kept copping it. Mm. Oh, well, I'll probably say Alton to Harry. He was tough. And I tell you what, he had real heavy hands too. He didn't look like it on footage, but he had heavy hands. Um, and all the Filipinos, they don't get the credit they deserve. They're tough as nails and they all can punch. So, yeah, I don't know. Pick any of them. Raymond Tabagon was tough. Oh, yeah. What about you, James? Yeah, I'm just trying to think. Um, what was that Mexican's name that I fought, that fought Diego De La Hoya just recently? Is that Benache? Nah. That's not. One of the, uh, no, it wasn't Bernard. Uh, no. the, one of the Mexicans I fought fairly early on. It was um, he's actually had a couple of good wins recently, and um, it was probably a fight that I don't get much recognition for. But uh, yeah, he was maybe, actually he's a solid fighter, and he he could really hit to the body. So he was he was probably the toughest bloke I fought so far. What about the dirtiest fight you've ever fought? Just a filth bag, grab ya, clinch ya, talk shit, bite ya. Or well, I had a bloke, a Ukrainian fighter in the amateurs who tried to snap my arm. And I reckon he was pretty close. He yeah. must have practiced it. We got in a clinch and he just did this move and nearly snapped my arm and then hit me at the same time. That, I was like, what the fuck's going on here? <laughs> yeah, probably him. Jase? No, I haven't really had any dirty fighters yet. Oh, uh, fuck uh, off. You're in the fucking best division. Those Mexicans are filthy. No, how many are the head butts and fucking elbows and come on? They don't you know, want to poke a bear. They know. Oh, they yeah. Good response. That. Great response. <laughs> right, who's who's the fighter you you're happy you never fought? Most competitive people say, "I want to fight everyone." But is there a fighter that you fought? Oh, fucking thank fuck! I didn't have to fight him. Andrew thinks that about me, but. <laughs> 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 no, mate, you're on. You're on. Uh, um, that I, no, uh, that I didn't fall. No, we haven't just fought Lomachenko, did you? No, we both nah. sparred with him. But didn't you ever think, like, oh, fuck, I don't want to fight this prick? I wouldn't want to fight Loma. Fuck that. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, is it, was he the one yeah. that you just fought? Oh, fuck that. I don't want to fight him. Yeah, let's go, Loma. He, he was unbelievable. <laughs> He was unbelievable. Yeah. The story there, we were, um, we were at Robert Garcia's over in America and we just finished sparring. We were sparring with Evgeny Yev- Gradovich, who some people know that fought Billy Dig twice. We were sparring he with him. World, he was world champ at the time as well. At the time, yeah. Uh, he was IBF yeah. world champ at the time. Russian, and we'll, the Russian-Mexican, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we were sparring with another couple of youngsters, Joey Gonzalez, who's, who's a, who just recently fought Shakur Stevenson for the world title. And, yeah, the, we had a really good sparring session there. And then um, Bradovich's manager, who's also also Loma's manager, walks up and says, hey, boys, um, Loma's sparring partners can't make it today. Would you be able to come back this afternoon and, and spar Loma? And we were like, fuck, yeah. How good is this? We just finished. We just finished, probably done eight rounds. Just finished. And we, like, we where we were staying was over an hour away from there. We were like, no, nah, sounds good, mate. So we just went down. Sat, uh, had had a bite to eat real quick, chilled out for like half an hour. Came straight back to the gym, jumped in the ring with with Loma, and like I've sparred. We just sparred Gradovich, but I've sparred other world champions before, and always held your own. And 
felt pretty comfortable in there, but Loma was just on a completely different level. He he's just yeah. one step ahead of you the whole time and just putting you under this crazy sort of he's not that in your face, but you just feel under pressure the whole time and as soon as you go to do something, it's like he knows you're gonna do it and he's just all over you. As soon as you wanna work, he's out of there. No, you know, you can't you can't even you can't throw your punches, he's just right out of your way. He's off on an angle and then as soon as you want to take a break, he's on you like a rash. It's just it was unbelievable. Yeah. It was like that in the amateurs too. Like only people involved in amateurs understand the ability he had. He was a freak in the Olympics, like at the amateur level. He's a, you know, he's he's transferred to the pros. Unfortunately, I think his style might come to a point where he walks on to something soon. Um, but in saying that, he's the the best boxer I've ever seen, like naturally gifted. He's fucking a freak. Yeah, he's a freak. Um, the best pound for pound fighter in the world, in your opinion, right now. And so, um, you you want to say Loma because of his when you watch him, he's just a freak. But I think of who they've beat and their resume. I reckon Canelo. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd probably go with I'd probably go with Canelo. Good answer. Good answer. Who's the most overrated fighter in the world? Start some beef. Overrated. Joshua yeah. Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Joshua yeah. Rudy. <laughs> yeah. Is there anyone that you think gets too much attention and just not worth it? Is there anyone? No. Mm. No, probably not really, mate. Um, no, us boxers need attention, mate. We don't get enough of it, especially. Oh, yeah, he's, he's all have fucking little mental disabilities. All boxers always want more attention. It's fucking. All right, <laughs> uh, well, couple of couple of fight questions. Who wins? Uh, rematch: Mayweather versus Canelo. Right now. Right now, rematches. With 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 the time Floyd's out the ring, had out the ring, and his age, I think Canelo beats him now. But Floyd's a freak. Animal, yeah. Yeah. Same as well, yeah. Jase. Yeah, I'll go with Canelo now. It, I am a Floyd fan, but it's sort of it's sort of starting to shit me how he just wants to stay relevant and keeps coming up out of the woodworks. And I just think you've had an amazing career. Just sit back. You know, start promoting your younger fighters and, you know, just let someone else have the spotlight. Um, yeah, I think Canelo gets in there. How about Tyson Fury or AJ? Fury. Tyson Fury. Easy. Yeah, Easy. I fucking love him. He's my, 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 one of my all-time favourites now. He's yeah. after Ali. He's straight after me. He's, oh. What a fucking show. Yeah. I like I mean, AJ, I yeah. but, um, but Fury plays with him 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's yeah. just too smart and too big, eh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, last question. Most important. I ask this to everybody. Who wins in a street fight? Striker or takedown? <laughs> With boxes, you got to say striker. Fuck it yeah. up. You better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, both of you are strikers, right? We got that? That's it. Yeah. That's it. All right. Boys, hey. Thanks for your time, man. It's you know, a bit over an hour. I bullshit it to you. I said 45. I've got more than that. Um, <laughs> pleasure, I wish mate. you both I wish, I wish you both the best in what's coming up. I know it's hard waiting because you're right at the pinnacle of your careers. Um, yeah. I hope to God Australia gets behind you guys because we need people like yourself really dominating out there. in the world. And there's not many fighters in this country that can dominate in the world like you guys can. So I hope yeah. you guys get all that opportunity. You're the right team. You've got the right people behind you from your manager to your trainer to your promotional company um, here in Australia and in, in America. Boys, um, hopefully speak to you before you go overseas again, okay? Um, we'll get good, an mate. update. Mate, I wish you all the up. best. You gotta come mate, I'm coming. Before, mate. I'm coming. Just not Oklahoma. Not Oklahoma, please, all right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get up to some shit there. No worries. I'll find some. Yeah. All right, boys, hey, I wish you all the best. Uh, let's keep in touch. And, yeah, mate, thanks, thanks for coming much, on the show, man. boys. All no, the best, boys. Cheers, Cheers, mate. Cheers. Bye-bye.